Hello everyone, this is Dr. A. We are going to talk about viruses today. Okay, so here's a, some fun facts about viruses. So viruses infect every type of cell, including bacteria, algae, fungi, protozoans, plants, and animals. Seawater can contain 100 million viruses per milliliter, which is crazy. Um, and 10% of the human genome consists of sequences that come from viruses. 10 to 20 percent of bacterial DNA contain viral sequences. For many years, the cause of viral infections was unknown, uh, and that's because you can't see them, not even with a light microscope. Louis Pasteur postulated that a living thing smaller than bacteria caused these diseases. He also proposed the name virus, which is Latin for poison. Um, is a virus alive? There are two sides of the debate. So since viruses are unable to replicate independently, so um, if, if you will, the way, what that means is if you have a virus on the surface, it's not going to grow and make two viruses, right? If it's just on the surface of like your counter, whereas bacteria will, okay? And uh, so it has to have a host cell. So it cannot, it is not able to replicate independently from the host cell. And there are not living things that should be called uh, and therefore should be called infectious molecules. Um, they're not living because they don't, eat, they don't have metabolism, they don't have waste, they can't reproduce themselves uh, independently and all of that. So they, they just don't meet the characteristics of being alive. Um, so even though viruses do not exhibit most of the life processes of cells, they can direct them. And thus certainly uh, they're not just inert or lifeless molecules because they can cause things to happen, it can cause disease, etc. So we cannot, you know, ignore that, obviously. And so, uh, therefore, viruses are really better described as active or inactive rather than alive or dead. So when you have something that is technically killing viruses, it's really just inactivating them. All right, so some of the properties of viruses. So they are obligate intracellular parasites of bacteria, protozoa, fungi, algae, plant, and animals. Again, meaning that in order for, do their, for them to do their thing and to make more viruses, they have to be inside of a cell, all right? An estimated 10 to the 31st power of virus particles on Earth, and there's approximately 10 times the number of prokaryotes, meaning uh, there are 10 times more viruses than there are bacteria and archaea. They are ubiquitous in nature, that means they're found everywhere, and they have had major impact on the development of biological life. They are ultra microscopic in size, ranging from 20 nanometers to 450 nanometers in diameter. Um, they require an electron microscope to be viewed. Um, they are not cells, um, and their structure is really compact and economical. They uh, do not independently fulfill the characteristics of life. The basic structure of a virus cons consists of a protein shell called a capsid, that is around a nucleic acid core, nucleic acid being DNA or RNA. So it's code in uh, uh, with a coding, that's it. And uh, the nucleic acid itself, this is kind of strange here. So it can be double-stranded DNA, nothing strange there, but it can be single-stranded DNA. Now that's kind of weird because um, our cells and animal cells and all that do not have single-stranded DNA. Uh, they can be uh, single-stranded RNA, and that's normal because that's what we have. We have single-stranded RNA, but it can also be double-stranded RNA. So all of this is, is really odd. So they have four different types of nucleic acid cores that are possible. Um, molecules on the virus surface, their spike will impart a high specificity for attachment to the host cell. So that is... Um, what makes certain viruses invade certain tissues in certain species, basically. It's their, the proteins on their surface. Uh, they multiply by taking control of the host genetic material and regulating the synthesis and assembly of new viruses. So basically, they come into a cell like a pirate, and they take over that cell and make it do um, basically what it wants to, which is make new viruses. They lack the enzymes for most metabolic processes. If they have enzymes, they usually have taken it from the cell that it was inhabiting. 
and they do not have the machinery for synthesizing protein. That is why if you have a virus on the surface, it cannot make more viruses. Okay, so size comparison. I really do like to keep this again in check. So um, our last lesson, we were talking about um, budding yeast right here. Uh, here's budding yeast for scale size. And if you had some of the protozoans we talked about, it would have been w even way bigger than that. Okay, and so in relationship, so to these budding yeast, you have um, some bacteria here. So some um, short rods here, the E. coli and some uh, cocci. So you can see already some bacteria, the prokaryotes are smaller than the eukaryotes here, but then you have viruses. So these are a couple of the biggest viruses, right, which are a little bit smaller than the cocci. Uh, again, not able to see those with a light microscope. Here's some really small bacteria, rickettsiae. We can't see those with a light microscope either. Um, all of these here, we need electron microscope. And then you have viruses such as herpes, rabies, HIV, flu, adenovirus, et cetera, et cetera, polio. And so you can see get them smaller and smaller. Again, in comparison to a yeast cell and a bacteria, you can kind of see their relative size. Okay, so I'm gonna play this video, but it's gonna be muted, so I'll, I'll do the commentary on it. And I guess I'm make sure this is muted here, okay. <clears throat> All right, so this is a video from NPR, and it's about what happens when you um, get a viral infection. So this guy sneezed, let's assume he's got the flu, and his little sneeze droplets are full of viruses. Ta-da, very, very relevant for nowadays. Um, and so these millions of droplets of uh, sneeze can go up somebody that's nearby up their nose and go dock into the throat cell. So these are the two animators, uh, well, the animators and the interviewer that um, created this video. So the guy here that got the virus, got the sneeze, inhaled it, the, the little virus particle is going to go and those receptors, they're those, these are the molecules on the surface, right, of the virus, and they're like little keys, and these are the receptors here on the surface of the cell, and those are the locks. And if the lock and key match, then the virus can dock and enter into the cell, and the cell takes it in. It's making a little, uh, what call a little welcoming community, kind of a little bit of a, of a vacuum, pulls it in, um, and then it's going to uh, digest it and kind of disassemble it, but it will release while it does that the um, all the capsids, but then the, the nucleic acid here. So these are uh, a segmented RNA nucleic acid core um, in there, and in, sorry, inside the, the core, the nucleic acid, and it's going to the nucleus because that's where uh, polymerase lives, and polymerase can make copies of the nucleic acid material. So here it's going to make copies of the RNA. And so um, it's gonna make copy after copy after copy here of the, um, the genetic material. And so therefore, um, so this is the normal part of the cell and it's part of its normal job. The, the code, the viral code, is sent to these ribosomes right there, which ribosomes read it and cook up the proteins. Proteins are sent back. The DNA or the RNA that had been copied is uh, reassembled here, and it's going to pick up a coding by using the surface of the cell, and there we go, and it's going to bud off and go infect another cell, and the whole process starts over again. So you have one virus going in, a whole bunch, like millions, coming back out. And um, again, um, and it'll spread from throat, to throat cell to throat cell. Now we have a, what should be like 100 trillion cells in our body. So just the fact that one cell makes a million viruses, it's still not that significant. I mean, it'll make you sick, but then of course you have your immune system. So this represents white cells engulfing the antibody-coated viruses to protect you. Um, and so even though these guys, one cell can make a lot of viruses, um, you do have your immune system to protect you. And these little antibodies here would coat the viruses, uh, which will allow the white cells to eat them and also prevent them from docking onto the receptors. 
All right, so let's look at our first case. So a lethargic 22-month-old female was presented by her mother to the emergency room at 2.15 a.m. on a Sunday. The child had a history of a runny nose, a hoarse cough, and low-grade fever, about 99, for the past 48 hours. The mother was concerned about the forced and noisy breathing of the child. The pediatrician examined the child and found cloudy eyes and a mild inflammation of the ears but no overt signs of bacterial infections, so no significant changes in the eardrums. The throat of the child <clears throat> was red and coated with mucus, and the larynx was swollen and raw. The physician performed a rapid strep test and found it was negative. The throat swabs were taken for a culture. The physician placed the child in a room with a warm vaporizer for about 30 minutes. This dramatically improved the breathing of the child. Okay, so first poll with the description of this case, what would be your presumptive or clinical diagnosis? So a clinical diagnosis is a diagnosis that is made with uh, just a presentation of the patient. So like when you look at all the signs and symptoms together, um, and here you actually did have one, the rapid strep test, so that can help you too. But um, Basically, a clinical diagnosis is using the signs and symptoms of the patient, the presentation of this patient. So you have a strep throat, you have a common cold, um, which are caused by adenovirus, rhinovirus, and coronavirus. Uh, and yes, coronavirus normally causes just a common cold. RSV, which is respiratory syncytial virus, flu, which is the influenza virus, and whooping cough, which is corneal bacterium diphtheriae. So, Hopefully you can figure out or guess which one you think it is. I'll tell you here in just a minute. Okay, so first of all, um, here's a big difference. So um, I had put strep throat in there as a solution. Well, we're in the virus chapter, so you probably should deduce that she likely doesn't have strep throat. We don't kind of already covered that anyway. But strep throat pharyngitis, you have these white patches on the swollen tonsils, okay? So that's indicative of strep throat. If you don't have any white patches and it's just uh, red and swollen and just kind of angry looking there, then it's more likely a virus that's causing it. So um, that's a quick way to see um, whether you should suspect strep throat or just a virus. Okay, so will the throat culture likely show evidence of streptococcus pyogenes or staph aureus? So um, that one should be pretty logical. So um, part of the protocols when we do this uh, rapid strep throat test, which in this case have come back negative, is just in case it's a false negative, they go ahead and take that swab and plate it to see if it will actually grow strep throat um, on a plate just in case the test didn't work right, somebody maybe didn't add the right reagents or something like that. It's a requirement now, it's like a standard protocol. Okay, so uh, so no, it wouldn't, you know, the answer to that is no, it's not likely, not going to be a bacterial infection. So what all points to this being a viral infection? So I've already given you some of the answers. So put right down here why you, you would go, you would think virus more than you would bacteria. And what she has <clears throat> is adenovirus. So again, adenovirus is uh, one of the three viruses that causes, the three types of viruses that cause a common cold. So now I've, I've got to tell you, there are like a uh, hundred different varieties of the common cold. And we have not bothered with trying to do any type of vaccination because the common cold is just not that severe. It's annoying. Uh, there are so many strains out there. It just, it's just not, it's not really feasible to get a vaccine against this one, and it's not really practical either. So this is adenovirus, uh, and we're going to look at the, the structure and the shape of it, but just kind of remember what this, this looks like here. Okay, so let's look at the virus component, viral component. So viruses bear no resemblance to cells, and they lack any of the protein synthesizers machinery found in cells, i.e. they act they, they uh, lack ribosomes and Golgi apparatus and that kind of stuff. The viral structure is composed of regular repeating subunits. Um, those are called capsomeres. 
that give rise to their crystalline appearance of the core, and that is the capsid. So those capsomeres um, give that, that geometrical shape to the virus. The structure contains only the parts needed to invade and control a host cell. So um, it has usually an external coating. Not all of them have a membrane coating on there. Then, uh, but so some of them, the external coating would just be the capsomeres. It would just be that, that geometrical shape. Inside of that, you have the core that contains uh, one or more nucleic acid strains of DNA or RNA. It's never both. If it's a DNA virus, it only has the DNA. If it's an RNA virus, it only has RNA. It never matched, never, never both. <clears throat> and then sometimes there's one or two enzymes, and if there is, it's simply they, they sw swipe them from the cell that we're in. And they're good at that. If they need that enzyme to invade another cell, they'll just take it from the previous cell. So um, the capsid is that protein shell that surrounds the nucleic acid. That's the one that has this ge cool geometrical shapes. Uh, the term nucleocapsid, it refers to the capsid with the nucleic acid altogether, okay? And uh, naked viruses only have a nucleocapsid. So they have the genetic material and the protein core that's geometrical, and that's it, nothing else. Um, those, um, again, the capsid is made of identical protein subunits, and those are called capsomeres, and this, which is, I think this is super interesting, the capsomeres will spontaneously self-assemble uh, into the finished capsid, just like if they were like magnetic, they just go psh, and come together, they're attracted, and they make these really cool geometrical shapes. So there are two main types of geometrical shapes that these um, capsomeres will, will do as they assemble. They'll either make a helical, so like a helix, so it'll be like a, a twisty um, kind, or they'll make it icosahedral. So this icosahedrons, uh, so that should take you back to geometry, are a 20-sided shape. So if you ever seen like, I don't know, like a Dungeon and Dragon dice that has 20 sides, or something like that, you can get the, the idea of an icosahedron. The adenovirus is a naked virus that has an icosahedral shape. Um, and then some of them have an envelope. Um, so an envelope would be an exter external covering of the nucleocapsid, and it's usually a modified piece of the whole cell membrane. So it would be modified by adding the viral spikes and stuff to it, or viral proteins to it, and uh, but the, the nucleocapsid wraps itself in that cell membrane with those spikes before it leaves as it buds out like we saw in the video. Um, so if the virus has an envelope, it's called an envelope virus. If the virus uh, does not have an envelope, it is called a naked virus, okay? The spikes can be find, uh, found on naked and enveloped viruses. So for enveloped viruses, those spikes are poked into the cell membrane and picked up on their way out. For the naked viruses, the spikes are attached on the nucleocapsid. Um, and uh, the, the idea with the spikes is uh, they allow viruses to do dock with the host cell. So those, are, those spikes are the keys that can fit on the receptors um, on the surface of the cell that it can infect, and that's what allows it in. A virion is a fully formed virus that is able to establish an infection in a host cell. All right, so here is adenovirus. So you can see this, uh, it's a 20-sided shape. So think triangles here, triangles, triangles, triangle of 20 of them right there. And at each uh, place which the triangles meet, there is a spike right there, okay? And the spike are the keys that allow it to dock on the receptors. Uh, there are also, the spikes are considered antigens, they're antigenic, uh, which mean you can mount an immune response to it. Uh, if you look inside, so this is a cross section, so you can see the capsomeres here that are forming the icosahedron. You can see the spikes here, right there, and inside here you can see it's um, linear, linear genomic DNA. So um, Adenovirus is a DNA virus right there, and it has one long linear uh, DNA strand, double-stranded DNA. And so there you go. So you get just as very simple as 
genetic material, protein core, spikes. And that's it. And that little sucker can cause all these problems with the common cold. Okay, so this is one where it's, okay, your turn. Describe the structure of adenovirus. I just described it, so um, you put it in words and enter it there. Next poll question, um, is this virus, so adenovirus, is it a naked virus or is it an env enveloped virus? So answer that. So let's talk again about the variety in the viral nucleic acid. So um, you have DNA or RNA, never both. If there are DNA viruses, they can be single-stranded or double-stranded, and they can be linear or circular. So adenovirus we saw was linear, so it's just one straight line. If it's circular, it literally it makes a loop. It makes like a you know a circular ring. It's a ring uh, form of DNA. And um, if it's an RNA virus, it can be double-stranded, but it's more more than often single-stranded. So double-stranded vir uh, RNA viruses are kind of rare. Uh, and it can also, of, of course, if it's single-stranded, so it's most, most often single-stranded, can be positive-sense RNA or negative-sense RNA. So um, positive-sense RNA are ready for immediate translation. Translation is uh, when you feed the RNA into the ribosome, it's made into protein. That's the process of translation. So positive-sense RNA can literally be fed immediately into a ribosome and you get a protein. And the negative-sense RNA has to be converted to positive sense RNA before translation can occur. So it has to be flipped. Uh, so basically it's written backwards and has to, yeah, it has to be uh, written into the positive sense to be read. Um, and RNA viruses can be segmented. So they can be like little chunks like we saw in the video, little segments, right? Little, little pieces, um, like one code per piece kind of thing, or maybe a couple of them. And then retroviruses are RNA viruses that carry their own enzymes to create DNA out of RNA. And they do steal those enzymes from the cell that they came from. So an example of a retrovirus would be HIV. Okay, so uh, do you remember what type of nucleic acid did adenovirus have from our case? Was it single-stranded DNA, double-stranded DNA, single-stranded RNA, or double-stranded RNA? Okay, so um, how does it enter a throat cell? So remember, we just, we watched a video. Um, so explain the, the process of how the virus um, enters the throat cell, kind of as related as uh, what they were talking about in the video. Okay, so uh, here is a representation of that. So remember the uh, spikes that are either on the envelope or on the nucleic, as, uh, nucleic, nucleocapsid core, sorry about that, um, are the keys that can dock on the receptors that are found on the host cell membrane. And um, that this, this spit of the, the, the locking key, again, is what allows the virus to enter the cell, but it is also what the, makes the virus specific for a certain cell type. Um, and that's really important um, because it, it determines where the damage is done and where the signs and symptoms will come from. And it also determines whether or not it can actually establish infection in you um, for that. We're going to talk about that here in just a second. So anyway, they, they, the, the spikes have to dock onto the receptors and then the cell will pull the particle in because it thinks that it just basically just got a delivery. You know, Amazon Prime just showed up with a package and it's time to bring it in. Okay, so this process is uh, of the, the spikes docking on the receptors is called adsorption, okay? And so a virus can invade its host cells only through making the exact fit with a specific host molecule. So that, um, that antigen, that, that spike receptor fit, that lock and key fit, it has to be exact. Um, and so that is what I was hinting at with the host range. Um, the limited is a limited range that of cells that a virus can infect. So, for example, hepatitis B infects the liver cells of human. So, I want you to think about this for a second. How can you get hepatitis B? So, hepatitis B you can get through dirty ne needles or used to be through transfusions. Now we screen, 
but um, so if you get um, injected with a dirty needle from somebody that had hepatitis B, you can get hepatitis B. So blood is one way you can get hepatitis B. Uh, it can be sexually transmitted. That's another way. So um, if you think about it, well, if you get it through blood or if you get it through sexually transmitted, then why does it not simply infect your blood or cause an uh, STD? Because it doesn't cause either one of those things, but it gets into your blood, it gets into your system, and uh, it homes to the uh, hepatocytes, the the liver cells. And the reasons the reason it does that is that's the only cell in the human body where the lock and key for that virus works, basically. And so it can enter the the hepatic cells, and that's where it causes damage. Uh, Polio is uh, intestinal and nerve cells of primates, so it can cross uh, different species. Um, but again, polio um, virus, um, I believe you would get through like uh, respiratory contacts and stuff, right? Uh, and in rabies, uh, various cells of all mammals. So uh, rabies is uh, quite adept at getting in and it can affect you know dogs and cats but also humans uh, and raccoons and stuff like that and it gets into the neural cells and other cells and um, it's in the saliva and so it definitely it has a wide host range so cells that lack compatible virus receptors are resistant to absorption and invasion by that virus so that virus cannot enter that cell or in, therefore infect that cell and so the Tropism is what we call is the specificities of viruses for certain tissues. That is what tropism tropism is. Okay, so once that cell has uh, so once the virus has adsorbed onto the cell, we have penetration and uncoding. So the flexible cell membrane of the host um, cell is penetrated by the whole virus or its nucleic acid. So uh, the whole virus, that means the whole virus is taken in, right? And that would be through usually through endocytosis. Uh, there are some, um, if you look up bacteriophage, I don't have a picture of them, but they're pretty cool. They're in your book. They actually uh, infect bacteria. They dock onto the bacteria. They look like a little spaceship. And then they inject their uh, DNA material or RNA material, whatever material they have. They're injected straight into the bacteria. It's really interesting. So. Um, there are two ways the virus can penetrate through um, the cell membrane. There's endocytosis and fusion of the viral envelope. So um, endocytosis means the entire virus is engulfed by the cell and enclosed in a vacuole or vesicle and taken in. So your naked viruses would do that. Um, but uh, direct penetration is so the fusion of a viral envelope. Therefore, that, that would be with enveloped viruses, right? And they have to have an envelope. That envelope, remember, is made from the cell membrane of the cell it just came from. And basically, that cell membrane can fuse with the cell membrane of the cell that's trying to enter. Uh, and that, well, I'm going to show you a picture in a second, second and that can cause um, then the, the virus to be able to enter the cell. And then uh, once it is entered into this inside the cell there's uncoding which um, is basically releasing that genetic material from the the core here so that it can go inside the nucleus and get copied so enzymes in the vacuole can dissolve the envelope in the capsid um, the virus fuses with the wall of the vesicle uh, and the vesicle contains enzymes and stuff and then viral nucleic acid is released into the cytoplasm so here is that picture I was promising you. So on this side here, you have endocytosis. So you have uh, a virus and its little spikes. It docks. There's a match. And then the cell, like, basically pulls it in and, and, and bends this membrane to form a vacuole, completely close it, and then enzymes will fuse with it. Uh, dissolve the the coding and release the genetic material okay so that's endocytosis and this one the virus docks and what happens is there's fusion of the viral coding the viral envelope with the membrane 
and as you can see here the viral membrane becomes part then of the cell membrane and then that releases um, the nucleocapsid but then the the viral um, um, the capsid part gets um, disintegrated falls apart and it, the DNA is released okay so what would you think the treatment would be in this case for this child that came to the ER and uh, has basically a common cold? Would you give her antibiotics? Would you give her antiviral medications? Or would you give her supportive care, which would be, for example, decongestants, fluids, humidity, etc.? So before I read this other case, let's address that. Um, so if you read the case, you can already um, see that in the previous case that the physician had done supportive care because they had started her on a humidifier and stuff. And um, so with a viral infections such as a common cold, one, you do, don't give antibiotics because antibiotics treat bacteria and not viral infections, so it's completely useless. Um, there are no antiviral medications for the common cold, and so you would have to do supportive care. Um, supportive care is the treatment of choice for most viral diseases. Okay, so let's read this case. So this is a 22-year-old male college student. It was He was presented to the ESU Health Clinic. Uh, he looked tired and pale. He was present. He presented because of high fever and chest pain. He was afraid he was having a heart attack. He had a bad week of exams, so he was stressed, right? He was examined immediately by the PA, physician's assistant, and an EKG strip was run to check his heart rate and all of that, and his, uh, what his heart was doing. There was no evidence of an acute heart attack or acute heart problems. The uh, attending physician visited the patient. He obtained a following history from the past 36 hours. The patient had a tight cough. He, was, he had significant muscle aches and pains, and he had had a bad headache and has had uh, fevers of 101 to 103. Uh, the physician ordered a chest x-ray, and it did not show any significant consolidated inflammation suggestive of pneumonia. Uh, so, no, did not suggest pneumonia, right? The patient shows significant nasal drainage and then a moderately tight but productive cough on physical exam. He had a fever of 101 and generally inflamed mucous membranes. A rapid strep test showed no evidence of streptococcal infection and his tonsils and adenoids had already been removed so that you can't really see them, so. Okay. So what would you think this little guy has? So would he have strep throat? Would he have a common cold? Um, so again, same adenovirus, rhinovirus, coronavirus. Would he have RSV? Would he have the flu? Or would he have pneumococcal pneumonia? And what were your clues to uh, the diagnosis that you chose? So enter that there. Okay, so he has the flu. So for one, um, you, again, you should have suspected a virus and not a bacteria. So two of those could be ruled out pneumococcal pneumonia and strep throat, which all both cause bad bacteria. So those two can be ruled out. And so it left several viruses. Um, it's not a common cold, although it could potentially be, but usually with a common cold, uh, you don't run a fever as high as he did. And um, so that's, you know, that's one of the signs. And the fact that he lives uh, on a campus at a university makes him uh, more likely to get a flu because the flu will pass through the university pretty easily. Uh, because of so many students gathered in, you know, one area. And then um, it's not, it can't be RSV because RSV affects little ones. It does not affect adults or uh, college students and stuff. So it affects um, babies and maybe toddlers. So the flu, flu virus is an enveloped virus. So adenovirus we looked at was a naked one. This one's uh, an enveloped one. So it has an RNA genome that's segmented, single-stranded RNA that's in segments here. It has icosahedral uh, capsid right here, so the 20-sided shaped capsid, but then it's wrapped 
in an envelope that has N spikes and H spikes. So um, that is a human, gen the general structure of the human influenza virus. Okay, so um, I just described that structure for you. Type that up. Describe the structure of the influenza virus. So make sure you note uh, whether it's naked or enveloped, the type of genetic material it has, his capsid shape and stuff if you have. So try to give as much detail as you can. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the flu, the influenza virus. So um, the viral strains of influenza are identified by their variations in the H and N antigens, which are on its envelope. Um, there are 15 subtypes of H's and nine subtypes of N. So you can have H1, through 15 and uh, N one through nine and various combinations of those. So um, when do you go from one strain to the, another strain? When when uh, does, does numbering and all that change is when there has been substantial alteration in that protein, the protein of the H or the N, then it becomes the next number Right, and so right now we have 15 and nine um, as of the time that that slide was made, but it, we could have added more um, because the, the flu virus keeps um, mutating and it's so what it is is it's changing the appearance of the spikes. Um, and so that, that is called antigenic shift. Okay, as it, as it over time is changing the appearance of the spikes and um, there are some major ones that have occurred and every time it has an antigenic shift, basically it allows it to evade the immune system, the immunity that's been developed by the humans because it doesn't look like the same. So uh, it, it looks to your body, to your immune system, like a whole new virus. Um, and there are major antigenic shifts uh, in the flu virus, uh, flu yeah, flu virus that uh, resulted in uh, 1918 and 1957 and in 1968 and caused uh, worldwide pandemics there because it was such a shift that nobody had any immunity and so it, it just moved through. So on a side note, um, RNA viruses are more prone to um, uh, alterations like that in antigenic shifts because there are single stranded and not double stranded. And so it's easier for the code to be altered and changed. Uh, whereas DNA viruses are, are pretty stable. And so um, that is actually one of the reasons we're more concerned about coronavirus, uh, the COVID-19. So it's a coronavirus that was discovered, discovered in 2019. Uh, is that it's a RNA virus, so very similar to the flu in that aspect. Um, it's an enveloped virus, also for that similar to the flu, uh, which also means that it has the same potential of changing from year to year and uh, undergoing antigenic shift, and so it'll look like a new virus. You know, uh, every every few years, it's going to look like a new virus. Okay, so um, look up a flu strain by H and N type and list it here. Um, so there are several of them. There are some that are more well known than others. Uh, but just, yeah, look up flu strains by H and N type and just, just top one up. And some of them have alternate names, like uh, swine flu would be one of them, for example. Um, sorry, just think it's freezing up there for a second. Oh, there we go. Okay, how does the flu virus enter a throat cell, but then how does it exit that cell? So going back to that video we just we watched uh, at the beginning, uh, that video was about the flu virus getting into uh, the throat cells of the guy. Uh, and so do you remember, so again, remember um, enlist how it enters, but then how did it exit that cell? Okay, so we have, again, entering, you had uh, either endocytosis or viral membrane fusion. Uh, the viral membrane fusion happens if you have an enveloped virus. 
And then the released, um, once the genetic material has been copied and the capsid assembles around that genetic material, if it's an enveloped virus, then it's going to go uh, against the cell membrane and then push up and it will pick up a piece of the cell membrane and coat itself with it. And uh, it will have already inserted the spikes in the cell membrane. By the way, those spikes being inserted in the cell membrane of the cell are actually uh, in an indication for your immune system that this cell is infected with a virus and it could flag the cell for destruction by the immune system. Um, anyway, so it's going to pick up uh, its spikes and its uh, cell mem the cell membrane to will become its envelope, envelope and then it will, well, this is basically uh, the process of budding off and it will float away just like that they're doing right here. Um, and uh, the problem with that is with every virus that picks up some of the cell membrane, then there's going to be less and less and less cell membrane and eventually it just destroys the cell. All right, next question. Um, so uh, how does it replicate itself once inside the cell? Again, refer back to the video and write the process there. We're going to talk about it here for a second. Okay, so um, synthesis, we have replication and protein production. So uh, for DNA viruses, they enter the host cell nucleus and just are replicated and assembled right there. For RNA viruses, um, they are replicated and assembled in the cytoplasm because, um, you know, if you look at the normal function of a cell, DNA is, is always copied in a nucleus, and then um, if you need to make a protein, DNA is copied to RNA, then RNA is sent out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm to be made into protein by the ribosomes. So if the genetic material is already RNA, especially if it's positive since RNA, it can just it can just happen in the cytoplasm. It can just go be fed into the ribosomes and stuff. Although the RNA uh, genetic material does need to be copied, that can also occur in the cytoplasm. Uh, but it could occur in the in the in the nucleus also because the nucleus has copying machinery for that. Uh, again, retroviruses will turn the RNA genome into DNA, and they'll have to go do that into the uh, nucleus. Um, and then the assembly of the virus is put together using parts manufactured during the synthesis process. So we have the genetic material in with maybe it's little some proteins on it, and then um, the uh, capsomeres that assemble into a capsid, and then we have to make the the spikes, right, the antigenic spikes, and then everything has to be assembled uh, properly, and it just actually just it self assembles. Um, and then release is the number of viruses that are released by infected cells is variable. So that's uh, when it exits the cells. So um, the how, ma how many viruses can come out of one cell is determined by the size of the virus and the health of the host cell. And uh, so how, how um, good his cell membranes and stuff are. A small virus uh, can can you know, there can be a lot of them made, a bigger virus will be less. So for example, a pox infected cell can uh, release 3,000 to 4,000 virions. Um, and that's because pox is a rather big virus um, as you compare different viruses and size and stuff. But then polio, which is a tiny virus, um, can, cause a, uh, can release 100,000 virions per infected cell. So there's an immense, uh, potential for a very rapid viral proliferation there. Okay, so um, in the, this flu case, what would be the tr treatment that is indicated? So uh, would an antibiotic be indicated, an antiviral medication, or supportive care? And in this case, uh, even though supportive care is definitely a good answer, there is an antiviral medication. So um, this is looking uh, ahead a little bit on the antimicrobial chapter, but these are uh, different antiviral drugs. And if you look here, uh, the we have several of them right here. The inhib inhibition of virus entry uh, that is, so interferes with the receptor fusion and coding uh, processes. And we have uh, amantadine and all its relatives. Um, and so it's like Rolenza and Tamiflu. And uh, they, are, they have been designed to block entry of the influenza virus. Um, and so therefore, 
you need to give it early on in the infection. So you need to give it in the first 24 hours for sure. If um, the patient's already been sick for a few days, then you wouldn't uh, recommend this uh, course of treatment. You, it would be worthless, uh, especially if it's been 48 hours or more for uh, the, the patient to, to get Tamiflu. Now, if you have a family and maybe somebody got diagnosed with the flu, but they've already had it for you know a few days, but then others are starting to show symptoms, you, you're going to be pretty much 99% sure that it is the flu because you know we all pass through a family. So you could potentially go ahead and treat those family members with early symptoms with something like a Tamiflu uh, to limit the, the course of the disease. Okay, we'll cover some of the rest of these uh, antiviral medications later. So, but you definitely can do supportive care also. So what is the best way to prevent from getting the flu? So if you are living in a college dorm or um, uh, you're in a school where there's a lot of students and stuff like that, how do you prevent from getting the flu? And so obviously you should know it should be the flu vaccine. Now the flu vaccine, um, I would tell you, it, yeah, it's it will protect you. Um, some people still end up getting the flu. Part of that is because of that antigenic shift. And when they manufacture the flu vaccine, they're actually trying to guess at what it will look like that coming up year based on um, what it's been doing like in, in, in regions like um, Australia and stuff where the flu seasons kind of start and move their way through, through the, the world. So, um, yeah, they're just, they're trying, they, it's a predictive um, formula. And sometimes they <clears throat> do a really good job and sometimes they don't. And the, the years where they don't do as good of a job with the flu vaccine, you'll see a lot more cases and stuff. But um, anyway, the flu vaccine um, does offer some protection against the flu. Um, that is why it's often um, required for hospital employees uh, and recommended if you live on uh, in areas or on co college campuses and stuff where there's a lot of people in a small uh, small surface area. So uh, um, here's a fun slide with some uh, flu myths and flu facts. So myth, the flu shot can give you the flu. Uh, so that usually no because the virus has been inactivated. So it's it shouldn't give you now the one that's the nose spray. So that's not the flu shot. It's the nose spray. So the flu vaccination that's the nose spray. Um, that one is a weakened form of the virus and could potentially give you the flu. Um, the f fact the flu viruses used in flu shots are inactivated. So that is a fact. The, the flu shot has an in inactivated virus. Fact: If you get the flu vaccine, you're about 40, uh, sorry, 60% less likely to need treatment for the flu. So it does lessen your chances. It doesn't. That's not 100%, though. You got to see that's only 60% less likely to have to have treatment for the flu. Uh, and that doesn't. Need, and that's treatment, right? So it doesn't even. You could have a mild case of it too. Myth: Vaccines are not pr proven uh, to prevent the flu. Yes, they do help prevent the flu. Um, myth, I should wait to get vaccinated so that I'm covered through the end of the season. No, it's probably best, especially if you're at risk to get vaccinated early on and uh, to be protected uh, early. And you can be, <clears throat> if you feel like you need to be have another one later on, you could have a second flu shot if you need it. In fact, people should get a flu shot as soon as they are available because it takes about two weeks for those antibodies to develop. So you want to get ahead of it. And another fact, getting the flu shot provides benefits such as the potential to reduce uh, illness and prevent uh, time lost from work, which is, again, why the hospitals want you to get it, because they don't want you to miss work. So let's look at another case. Oh, you know what? Another thing to, a good way to not get the flu is obviously uh, cover your mouth when you're sneezing or cough you know, in your, your elbow and stuff and wash your hands. Okay. So that's, yeah, that's another good one. So, um, this case is a 26 year old white female. She presents to a physician's office with uh, genital itching and sharp, severe pain on the labia. She complains of three previous episodes of pain over the past six months. 
each of which were followed by the appearance of red sores, which uh, crusted and healed without a scar. On examination, the physician observes a cluster of small red blisters located in the area of the worst pain. No significant discharge was observed from the vagina. The patient's urine was clear and yellow. Urinalysis revealed normal, spe normal specific gravity, no sugar, no protein, no white cells, no red cells, and no bacteria. So completely normal urine, clear urine. The patient's temperature was 36.5 Celsius, so that is normal body temperature. The patient history reveals that she is unmarried. She has moderately sexually active and currently using um, an oral contraceptive, which she had been taking for about four years. So she's on the birth control pill. The woman stated she has had five sexual partners over the past year. And she reported that her episodes have become progressively more severe. So first question, what do you think she's got? So obviously but nothing but STDs up here. So do you think it's chlamydia, herpes, HIV, HPV, or syphilis? Do, 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 do. Uh, a couple of those are bacteria. I wonder which, if you know which ones those are. And she has herpes. So the signs and symptoms match herpes. Uh, it is a, a double-stranded DNA virus. Um, and so we have a linear double-stranded uh, DNA virus with a acosahedral nucleocapsid. And it is an enveloped virus right here. So it has an envelope and then it has uh, some glycoproteins, different uh, spikes here uh, all over. All right, so describe that structure that I just uh, described to you. And so this is another one that you actually do have um, treatment for that. So she could take uh, medication. And so um, the medication, uh, acyclovir or all the other cyclovirs are for, uh, like Valtrex is a big one. Um, what they do is uh, they inhibit the nucleic acid synthesis. So it uh, keeps it from making more of the DNA. There are purine analogs that terminate DNA replication in herpes, herpes viruses. So um, purine and pyrimidines are um, your two types of nucleic acids. Uh, so they're the ACTs and Gs, right? The, um, and uh, these, the, the medication here is a lookalike of one of those components, but it looks like it, but it doesn't function right. And so it doesn't, it, it can bind to it, but then something can't bind on the other side. So you can't keep copying and making that DNA chain. And so it stops that replication there of the genetic material. So uh, anyway, so there is treatment for this one. Uh, so there's a medication that she can take but it is a persistent infection. So the thing with the, the treatment there is uh, she can take the medication when she has an outbreak to, to kind of stop the outbreak, but she'll never stop having outbreaks. So it's not curable. It's treatable, but not curable. I don't know if you understand that difference there. Um, and so, um, HSV, so herpes simplex, is a persistent infection. Another one that was listed is uh, HPV, uh, human papillomavirus. Uh, and that one, instead of making red blisters, it makes degenital warts, okay? Uh, but both are persistent infections. So what happens is the cell harbors the virus and it is uh, the cell is not immediately lysed or destroyed. So uh, it can, the virus can remain for a few weeks or the remainder of the host's life, um, and it can just hang out and remain in the cytoplasm of the cell. So the provirus is when virus incorporates uh, into the DNA of the host. The measles virus is an example of that. So it basically goes and inserts the, its DNA copies, and it goes and just stores it in there with the host's DNA and just leaves it there. Um, and then it can reactivate out of the, that, that cell and cause uh, infections and stuff. A chronic latent state is basically what you get with herpes infections. You, 
um, they, the infection, the, the virus becomes periodically activated under the influence of various stimuli, uh, being sick or being under stress, or definitely two stimuli that can cause um, the, the outbreak to, you know, to start over again. And so uh, herpes simplex and herpes zoster viruses, uh, so, her, so what are herpes zoster viruses? Those uh, are varicella, so chickenpox and shingles. Uh, and um, so herpes simplex causes, um, you know, herpes, genital herpes, but also cold sores um, right here. And um, so these guys, once you have it, you'll never get rid of it. And it goes latent, so it goes to sleep. And then you get a stimuli and it activates, you get another breakout, usually in the same location. So, for example, if you always get a cold sore here, it'll always come back here because it actually goes... Uh, and stores into the um, nerve ganglion. And so it kind of follows the same nerve pathway. And with the herpes zoster, the chickenpox viruses, um, it, it does whatever nerve it get dormant, if it ever reactivates, it'll follow that nerve path and you can trace that nerve path uh, from all the, the breakouts uh, and stuff from uh, the shingles. Okay, so what other benign condition does it that it cause? Does it cause a just so herpes, herpes simplex? What other benign condition uh, or benign um, outbreak does it cause? And I already mentioned it. That was to cold sores. So that's what cold sores look like. So if your boyfriend or girlfriend has a, a cold sore and you've never had any, don't kiss them because uh, you will get it too. Or don't kiss them while they have a breakout because you'll get it too. That's how it spread, right, and sexually transmitted. So um, name another viral sexually transmitted infection. I actually had given you already some in that list of her possible um, diagnoses. So, um, yeah, just throw. What's another one? So obviously don't put herpes. We already put herpes. What's another viral sexually transmitted infection? All right. And uh, let's talk a little bit about viruses in cancer because one of the other viral um, in fact, sexually transmitted infection that affects more than half of sexually active adults is HPV. So that's human papilloma virus, and it causes uh, the you know genital warts, but then it can cause uh, potentially cause cervical cancer. Not all of them do. Uh, so experts estimate that 20% of cancers are caused by viruses. Um, transformation is the effect of an oncogenic or cancer-causing viruses. So uh, some viruses can carry genes that directly cause cancer, and other viruses produce proteins that will induce a loss of growth regulation that then lead to cancer. Transformed cells um, have an increased rate of growth, have alterations in chromosomes, have changes in their cell surface molecules, and have a capacity to divide in the, in the fin indefinitely, which is, again, what makes them become cancers and tumors and stuff. An oncovirus or mammalian viruses are capable of initiating tumors. Of those, we know uh, the papilloma viruses, so eight, that's where HPV comes from. Uh, the only certain strains, so the, the, the HPV vaccine um, pr will protect you against the strains that are most likely to cause uh, cervical cancer, but it will not prevent you from getting it one of the other HPV strains. Uh, herpes virus is another one, uh, hepatitis B virus, and HTLV1 virus, all, all considered oncoviruses. All right, so and that is your last slide. So if you have any kind of questions about all of these viruses and stuff, you're welcome to put it there. And that is the lesson. Thank you for your attention.